One of the most enduring questions in human history has been, are we alone in the, in the universe? Uh, we live in very exciting times because this is the moment we stand on the threshold of greatness, and it's associated with uh, NASA's astrobiology uh, program. As you see here on this slide, astrobiology uh, that NASA has uh, championed for well over 10 years now uh, is, is looking for questions dealing with the origin of life, the evolution of life, and its distribution in the galaxy. These are enduring questions that human beings have wondered about. What is our place in the galaxy? What does it all mean? How did we get here? I'd like to convey to you then a story, a story of what appears to be emerging in this multidisciplinary perspective involving astrophysics, geochemistry, biochemistry, planetary science. There is a story emerging about us. This place in the galaxy, this third rock from a, an ordinary star on the edge of a galaxy among a hundred billion other galaxies in the universe. There is a story, story emerging and we'd love to share it with you. Here are some of the questions that we're going to quickly go through because it sets the stage for this developing multidisciplinary story of us. The first one we'd start with then is where did the prebiotic building blocks uh, come from? Where did they come from? Life was, there once was a time on this planet where it was lifeless. And then it became life bearing. How did that happen? We are still looking for that, still under, trying to understand it, but we're making a lot of progress. And here's one of them. Where did the prebiotic molecules come from? Here's, some, here's a scenario, a very popular one, a very innovative one, a very exciting one uh, from the late Stanley Miller, probably many of you know about him, who worked with a Nobel Prize winner to suggest that if the Earth once upon a time, billions of years ago, had a, an atmosphere composed of the right kind of stuff, methane, ammonia, molecular hydrogen, and if it had lightning, that in a short time, putting lightning through a mixture of gases, simple gases, could produce amino acids. This kind of experiment could produce, for example, more than 70 varieties of amino acid, 70. Keep that number in mind because life on Earth only uses 20. In a short time, this experiment could produce 70 varieties of amino acid by putting lightning, simulated lightning, through a mixture of common gases. So the question was, were then the prebiotic molecules that formed life on Earth, that contributed to the formation of life on Earth, were they homegrown? Uh, the answer appears to be no. We now have good evidence to suggest, which was not available at the time that, in, back in the 1950s when Miller and Urey ran this very important experiment. We now have good evidence to suggest that the Earth did not have that composition of atmosphere. That that lightning in a bottle approach is not apparently the way that prebiotic molecules came to the Earth. In fact, they came from space. Comets and asteroids, piece of which you're seeing here in front of you, uh, contain themselves over 70 varieties of amino acids, the building blocks of proteins. These are manufactured in space. The prebiotic building blocks of life everywhere is in space. It's formed naturally in space. And here's, and much of the blackness that you see in that rock there is in part because it's rich in carbon. Not graphite like in pencils, but complex organic molecules, not living, but the precursors to life. When astronomers now uh, look out into space, they find uh, this is a spectrum uh, showing all these different peaks that you see there. As you look at the constellation Orion, uh, a very popular, of course, uh, beautiful constellation uh, in our night sky during the winter, uh, that area has a lot of gas and dust. Well, astronomers are picking it apart. They're looking at its spectra. What's in it? What's glowing there? Dust 
and complex molecules, complex organic molecules. So not only are these complex prebiotic molecules present in comets and meteorites within our own system, but they are throughout the galaxy. The next question I'd like to consider is, okay, let's imagine that prebiotic molecules that would contribute ultimately to the formation of life arrive on the earth, still lifeless, uh, in large quantities. How did they get assembled? Because those molecules are not living. And I'm suggesting here, again with that range of pictures across the bottom here, again trying to remind you, uh, buckle up, buckle up, in the next few minutes we're in for a ride. <laughs> we're in for a ride here, so uh, buckle up. Uh, we are going to see uh, the, the history of us uh, that is emerging from this multidisciplinary perspective of the cosmos and our place in it. So how were they assembled? Uh, in part, uh, kitty litter. <laughs> uh, kitty litter. I, I know that's a little bit degrading, but uh, the, uh, in, some of the ingredients in modern kitty litter consists of clay. And of course, we're all familiar with clay. And it isn't just any kind of clay, but there is, we have found, a kind of clay which comes from volcanoes, which when it falls into water, that ash, the volcanic ash, when it falls into water, can form a clay which can form complex organic molecules. It can assemble RNA polymers. RNA polymerizes in the presence of that clay. Now what I'm likening this to is on that right hand side you see a pile of bricks. A pile of bricks, uh, metaphorically I'm trying to suggest that comets and asteroids could have delivered the prebiotic molecules to the earth much like a truck brings a pile of bricks uh, to a building site. But somehow you need to take that pile of bricks and assemble it into something um, orderly like a home. Uh, the suggestion here is the pile of bricks, prebiotic molecules, were delivered to Earth, and the clays, there may have been other kinds of materials, but somehow those clays were able to assemble those prebiotic molecules into things which could have ultimately become living. The Earth then would have gone from lifeless to life-bearing without magic. When did it happen? There is a remarkable concordance of two disciplines arriving at similar answers to this important question. When did it happen? Uh, the geochemists are suggesting that Earth had already set the stage for life as far back as 4.4 billion years ago that the Earth, notice that the, if you imagine that the history of, of all of Earth is portrayed by that bar running across the screen there at the bottom, imagine that the length of that bar is 4,567,000,000 years. That's the age of the Earth. Uh, then Earth went Meshuggana uh, <laughs> during, during a very small portion of that time frame. And that small time frame is shown at the far right of that bar where that, where that red arrow was pointing. Earth went through virtually all of its major events, core formation, major catastrophic uh, internal events occurred within that very small bar right at the base of that red arrow. After that, Earth pretty much settled down. Earth had now set the stage for life. Earth had said, it's ready to go, go ahead. Whatever you want to do, do it now. It's okay, clear the way for you. Uh, the Earth then had set the stage for life very early on, and an emerging image of what the Earth may have looked like as far back as 4.4 billion years ago is what you see on the screen now. It appears to have had oceans, the atmosphere was a lot different than it is today, uh, but not as much perhaps as you might think. The moon was a lot closer, 
tides were probably in excess of a kilometer and the earth was probably spinning much fat and definitely was spinning faster than it is now with tides of a kilometer surfs up. <laughs> <laughs> But one of the other, the other notion, again, geochemists are saying it looks as if Earth could have been ready to go, as far as life was concerned, uh, by about 4.4 billion years ago. But actually, when might it have actually formed life? Uh, the biochemists, looking at uh, molecular clocks, here's a beautiful study I refer it to you, timetree.org, uh, from investigators uh, Hedges and Kumar. Uh, I would suggest that you take a look at that. It's a magnificent compilation, suggesting, as you see there in the text, uh, that life, from a biochemical sense, there is a memory in us. There is a memory. There is a memory in our molecules. There is a memory in our molecules as to when could life have happened. And they are reading that memory. And they suggest that life on Earth, read from the biochemical memory, uh, could have begin as, begun as far back as 4.4 billion years ago. Uh, now that's an interesting convergence of both geochemistry, studying rocks, and uh, biochemistry, studying molecules, biological molecules, and both arriving at similar answers. That's very exciting. The next question is this one here, and this is where we're going to buckle up, uh, because uh, what does what does life remember about the, the good old days? Or in this case, maybe not so good. Uh, imagine then that Earth has formed at 4,560,000,000 years. It goes through a great uh, cataclysmic set of internal events. And then uh, life may have begun shortly thereafter, maybe as far back as 4.4 billion years. Uh, what then does life remember following its origin? Uh, the diagram that you see here on the, on the left uh, shows you a version of what's known as the tree of life, the tree of all life on Earth as we currently understand it, the tree of all life. Uh, human beings and chipmunks uh, plot at the top, uh, at that very small, uh, a very small part there. Uh, but notice, I'd like to direct your attention to the broad, dark uh, lines at the base of the tree of life. What's being shown there? Uh, what we're looking at, and say this very fast, you'll be, you will be quizzed, uh, hyperthermophilic chemolithoautotropes. Uh, what we're looking at there is the base of the phylogenetic tree of life. The most primitive materials on Earth, life forms on Earth today, from which all other life forms derive, share a common characteristic, and that's what those big bold lines at the bottom of the tree of life show, is that they lived at high temperatures, high temperatures, in excess, in excess of 80 degrees centigrade. Pure water boils at 100. Uh, living at temperatures in excess of 80 degrees centigrade in dark places. They do not need sunlight. They don't even need organic molecules to feed on. They feed on some of the natural juices inside a planet. These, some, of these, some of these critters, one-celled organisms, living at the bottom of the tree of life, of all life on Earth, are one-celled organisms that live on such things as hydrogen sulfide. I agree. And uh, <laughs> carbon dioxide, car car carbon dioxide, uh, methane, uh, all sorts of very uh, rudimentary ingredients uh, that's what they live on. They do not eat cabbage and you know, lettuce or meat. Uh, they live on very basic kinds of molecules that occur naturally with inside planets. Uh, but notice here, they come from high temperature, dark places. Why? Why? And one of the possibilities is, of course, that that is the environment in which life formed on Earth. Dark, high temperature places, not connected in any way to the sunlight or anything else like that. Alternatively, and it's the one I'd like to explore with you, is that they are the survivors. They are the survivors. Survivors of what? Survivors, here's the connection. As we've looked up at the moon, you can see that the moon has a lot of craters on it. Could there be a connection between the craters on the moon 
and the base of the phylogenetic tree of all life on this planet. Let's imagine that the base of all life on this planet is high temperature, dark living organisms. How could there be a connection between the craters on the moon and uh, the base of the phylogenetic tree of life? Uh, what, what Stanley Miller and a colleague, uh, Lascano, suggested way back was that perhaps that base is caused by them being survivors. That they survived something awful. They survived something awful. And the awfulness is shown here as being that red vertical bar that perhaps something happened at about 3.8 billion years ago that caused life on Earth that had existed and flourished for possibly 500 million years before that suddenly be made extinct. And the only thing that got through were those high temperature loving organisms. Could it be that Earth and the inner solar system in general was pummeled by large objects, a shower of large objects from the outer solar system uh, that rained down and extinguished all forms of life that had flourished before that. But the only ones that made it through were the ones that were in the bunkers. The only ones that were in the bunkers uh, survived. How could that happen? What happened? Here's an animation uh, from the Southwest Research Institute. Dr. Hal Levinson and colleagues are suggesting uh, that all heck uh, broke loose in the outer solar system that may have contributed uh, to the, the origin of life on Earth. Now notice what you're seeing here are the orbits of the outer planets. Now if this particular animation bothers you, it should, because uh, in grade school we learned that Neptune is further out than Uranus. But look at the green, the green asteroids known in the Kuiper belt, and now you're going to see something happen. Uh, the planets change their position and end up scattering uh, millions of asteroids throughout the whole system. What does that cause? It causes a bad day. It causes a really <laughs> bad day uh, in which all of the stuff which had been stored, which had been stored in orbits, uh, suddenly are released uh, throughout the solar system and are collected uh, by, by other places. The craters on the moon appear to be formed at a very narrow interval of time. And apparently, we increasingly believe, are a result of the cataclysm that you're seeing uh, modeled here. So in summary then, are we alone? What's the history of us? What is the history of us? You have begun to see that by assembling this multidisciplinary perspective uh, funded by NASA, that we're beginning to learn more about ourselves. We've seen that where the prebiotic molecules may have come from, how they may have been assembled by kitty litter, uh, how, they, uh, how life uh, could have originated and when it did, and also uh, what does life remember. Uh, what it may remember is uh, something quite remarkable around 3.8 billion years ago. Uh, do other planets exist in the outer, uh, elsewhere in the galaxy? The answer is stay tuned. NASA has stay tuned uh, because NASA has the Kepler spacecraft currently measuring 150,000 stars uh, that, at this moment, looking for planets orbiting those, those stars. Uh, the data are coming in in large quantities. Uh, just in the last couple of months, 1,200 plus planets have been found already in the first four months of a multi-year mission. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, we are in for very exciting times, uh, perhaps finding life on exomoons. Yes, we will ultimately be looking for life on planets and moons orbiting other stars. NASA has in its sights uh, the capability of being not only able to detect planets elsewhere in our galaxy, but also to determine whether they are inhabited. Stay tuned, stay healthy, <laughs> do not get hit by a bus. Life is very exciting. Uh, we are on the threshold of answering some of the most profound and most durable questions in human history. So I leave you now with, of uh, course, live long and <laughs> prosper. Thank you. <laughs>